kitchen folks it's another experimental day in home brewing and today I'm gonna to have a go at making my own version of Aperol. So Aperol is an Italian aperitif it's a really dry and bitter drink it's commonly used in cocktails it's not something that I would like to drink neat but it's something which goes very nicely with Prosecco to make an Aperol spritz so that is what I'm trying to make I'm trying to make something which is going to be dry and it's going to be quite alcoholic but something that will mix nicely to make a good cocktail so here's what i'm going to put into my version of an aperol so it's a bitter drink so for bitterness i need seville oranges and i'm going to be using some of the juice and some whole oranges within there i'm going to be counterbalancing that bitterness with the sweetness of the juice from these uh, oranges just here I'm then going to be adding this rhubarb and ginger preserve from Mackay's which has got nothing harmful in the ingredients so I'm hopeful that that will uh, work nicely in it. Again for bitterness I'm going to make some hop tea and these are some hops just here. I'm going to use for my sugars a combination of this Agaven Dicksaft so this is from Aldi in Germany believe it or not and this is um, an Agaven syrup uh, not unlike a golden syrup, but with the ag agave flavour, so it's going to be quite sort of floral and herbal. I've got two kilos of brew sugar. I've got yeast nutrient. I've got pectolase. And the yeast nutrient is to feed the yeast, obviously. The pectolase is to help clear any pectic enzymes which might form. And my yeast of choice is going to be this dessert high alcohol yeast, because I'm trying to achieve something which is going to be between 11 and 15%. And then finally, I've got a couple of Earl Grey tea bags, which should give it a nice floral and herbal flavour. And these are also going to impart some tannins. One more key ingredient I neglected to mention is spring water. And I've got five litres going in initially, but there'll probably be eight litres or so going in there altogether. My fermentation vessel of choice today is the Muntins Wine Fermenter. So I'm aiming to make around about 10 litres. Although this will need to be wrapped, so the end product will likely be less than 10 litres, possibly 8 or 9 litres. It's all a huge experiment. I've got no idea how it's going to work out. That's the beauty of home brewing. Let's find out. So to begin the recipe, I'm going to add 5 litres of spring water into this pan. Flop, 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 flop. I'm going to add to that spring water my two Earl Grey tea bags and then I'm going to pour my hops in there so these are fresh hops picked from my own garden they're cascade hops I've got about 200 grams here all together they smell just like the day that I picked them so what I'm going to do with these is make some hop tea I'll just push those in these have been in the freezer so they've maintained all their qualities and their integrity and hopefully all the flavours and oils so I've got them on my cooker, on the back ring. I'm just going to put these on very low and I want them to come to a simmer and make a hop tea. This is going to take a couple of hours from start to finish and I'm just leaving it low. The key ingredient in home brewing is patience. You've got to have lots of it. I've got seven Seville oranges all together. Three of them I'm just using the juice from, but four of them I'm using whole. So I'm just going to give them a wash in case there's any waxiness on the skin. I don't think there is. Then I'm going to take each orange and I'm just going to take the top and the bottom off. I don't want to have too thick a pithy bit. So that's too thick a pithy bit. So I want to be able to see the orange flesh like that. And the same at the top just here. Okay, so I'm going to do this for each of them. So a quick update. The pith was quite thick and I've lost a bit more orange than what I'd anticipated. So I'm now going to use five whole oranges rather than four. I'm now going to cut my oranges into thin slices using this bread knife. They're probably going to be about 3mm thick or something round about that. So I've got a few to do, I'll come back to you shortly. I've got a couple of wire racks and what I want to do now is to lay out my orange slices on them so they're not overlapping if possible. So there are my Seville orange slices. But what on earth am I going to do with them? Let's find out. These bitter bad boys are going to go into my food dehydrator. So in they go. Okay. 
So this is a Turbotronic TurboWave Bio Food Dehydrator. I've got it on 70 and these are going to dehydrate for somewhere between 8 and 9 hours. I'll put it for 8 and a half hours and let's cross our fingers. So it's going to take a good long while for the oranges to dehydrate. This is going to be a two day recipe or if I'm lucky I might be able to manage it in one day but I'm imagining it's going to be two days. We'll find out later anyway so I'll catch you in a bit. Okay folks, it's four hours later, I've showered, I've had an haircut, and I've got a change of clothes. Ooh, I feel like a new man. Right, let's crack on with that brew. So the orange slices are about halfway through their dehydration. The hops have been simmering for about an hour. And I think, in all honesty, I should turn the heat off now. I've just done that, and I'm going to give them a mash with a potato masher. Right, I'm going to leave those to steep for a little while. So this is my bitter pan and this is going to become my sweet pan. So with that in mind, I'm going to add two litres of spring water into my sweet pan. Incidentally, it's January 2023 at the minute and the temperature outside is currently minus three. This has been in my front porch and it's absolutely freezing to touch. So it's going to take some warming up. So I'm going to put the heat on underneath this pan, just on a nice low heat, I don't want it to go raging. I'm going to dissolve my jam in this water, but let's just have a quick look at the ingredients. I'll read them out to you. So there's rhubarb and ginger jam ingredients, sugar, rhubarb, ginger, gelin agent, fruit pectin, acidity regulator, citric acid, and that's it. Uh, prepared with 35 grams of fruit per 100 grams and total sugar content is 65 grams per 100 grams and this jar is 340 grams so I times 60, uh, 65 by 3.4 to work out how much sugar's in there so that's obviously adding more sugar into the brew which is good I want that because I'm making something high strength okay so let's get into this I've never had Mackay's jam before it must be Scottish looking at the tartan on there do you know what Let's have a little cheeky taste. Oh, it's lovely. Very rhubarby and very gingery. Mmm. That is really good jam. Well done, my guys. So I'm going to start to spoon the jam into the water and it will dissolve over time. It will take a bit of time. Now, there are pieces of ginger in here which won't dissolve and I don't mind that. I'm going to let them into the brew and then they will get racked off at the racking stage. Okay, so there's the jam in the water. I am seriously playing the waiting game. Now the jam contains a lot of pectin which could cause haze in my brew. So I'm now thinking about adding my pectolase at this point. Now I'd never know when is the right time to add pectolase. In the comments, please, let me know. I normally add it into the demijohn at the time of putting it all together, but I'm going to put some in the pan now. So I'm going to put one, two, three sort of rounded teaspoons, not massively heaped. It is going to be a two gallon brew. So here's my agarven dick saft. So this is a plant which looks a bit like an aloe vera. I'm guessing it's going to have a similar sort of quality to it and this is basically packed full of sugar as well which is what I need. Oh yeah so it comes out like golden syrup would. See what this tastes like. Mm. Quite treacly as in golden syrupy. It's definitely got a different flavour though. I'm not going to say it's very aloe vera, but it's something, there's something floral to it. Imagine a floral golden syrup, something like that. Anyway, I'm going to stick the lot in. So I guess somewhere in between golden syrup and honey, maybe. So I'll just keep going. I need to achieve a high original gravity with this. I want it to be at least 11% and possibly um, up to 15%. What I don't want to do is just achieve that with brewing sugar alone because there's no flavour in brewing sugar. Anyway, as you can see, this is going to take me a little while to empty. 
I'll come back to you. Right, that is now all in as well. Right, I'm just going to give this a little swoosh around. Just to ensure there's nothing sticking to the bottom. Feels good to me, to be honest. And it feels quite buoyant. Ooh, there should be some flavour in that. Right, lid goes on. So I'm waiting for this to come to a simmer. I'm leaving that to steep for a couple of hours, all's in hand. So the jam seems to have melted nicely now. You can see the strands of the rhubarb that's in there. And of course the bits of ginger. But everything seems to have melted in this pan. I can't feel any resistance, so I'm going to turn the heat off. And just leave it with the lid on. Okay folks, it's a couple of hours later. The temperature has dropped outside. We're now on minus four. I'm pretty chilly actually. Um, anyway, I'm wrapped up obviously. Let's have a look at the hop tea. So here it is. And what I want to do now is get the hops out of there and strain it. So in order to do that, I'm going to use these two tools. I've got a ladle and I've got a sieve. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ladle my hops into the sieve. Keep doing that. All the liquid drips back through in there. I want to get all the hops out and I want to get the tea bags out. And then when my sieve gets full, I'm going to press it with the back of the ladle, like so. So I'm extracting the liquid, but I'm removing the solid. And the hops will go in the garden for compost and the liquid will stay in there and it's a nice hoppy tea. Right, I've got to keep doing this until I've got all the hops out of there. It's going to take me five minutes or so. I'll come back to you in a minute. That's the hop tea pretty much strained. I'm now going to add two kilos of brew sugar into there. And I'm adding this straight from the big bag that it came in. I've weighed it out, I know what's there. And this is increasing the physical volume quite a lot. And of course the sugar will increase the alcohol by volume too. Now brewing sugar, dextrose monohydrate, it does dissolve very easily if what you're putting it in is warm. And this is warm. So I'm not going to add any more heat to it. I'm just going to give it a little stir around. And that's it for now. So it's a case of lid on. I've got my sweet stuff over there. I've now got my sweet hop tea here and I've got my Seville oranges dehydrating over there. So this will be a two day brew and I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Morning from the kitchen folks. It's the next day which makes this preparation day two stroke brew day one because this is the day that this is all going together. It is a very cold one out there. It's currently 5.30ish in the morning and it's minus four outside, very heavy frost. So this is not a great time to be fermenting. So I'm definitely gonna to need to use a heat pad of some sort with my fermenter. Anyway, I need to get everything put together today. So my first job today is to juice my oranges. I've got my two Seville oranges and then I've got my five sweet oranges. So it's simply a case of taking each orange, cutting it in half, And then with that half, pressing it onto the juicer to extract the juice and to remove the pips. Et voila. And again, and again. Okay, this is a fairly repetitive process. So when I've done them all, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Okay, so that's all my oranges squeezed. And that's given me 400 ml of pure orange juice. Here are the orange slices that were in the food dehydrator. They've dehydrated overnight and now they're nice and crispy. And just to demonstrate that to you, that's a crispy orange. So these are going to give a nice burnt orange flavour to the brew. I'm going to put my orange slices into this bowl. And then using my rolling pin, I'm going to bash these down into smaller pieces. Then I'm going to take my broken orange pieces and I'm going to pop them into here. I'm 
and put the bottom on this. And now the noisy bit. So here is the net result of that. Wow, that is an intense orange smell. Quite marmalade actually. Hence the Seville oranges. So that's what five Seville oranges looks like as powder. So this will impart tons of flavour, absolutely tons. However, it will require racking. It's going to form a sludgy sediment line at the bottom, which is absolutely fine. And after about a 10 days worth of fermentation, I'll be racking this off to get it away from this, to continue the fermentation to a nice clean end flavour. My Mountain's wine fermenter is now cleaned and sanitised. I'm ready to get this put together. So firstly, in goes my dissolved rhubarb and ginger jam and the agave syrup. Now I'm going to put a sieve on before I pour the hop tea through, just in case there are any stray hops in the bottom, because I don't really want any more hops going into this, because they are very, very strong in terms of the flavours they impart. Big dramatic pour. Yeah, that seems to be going okay. Lovely stuff. So it's time to get my oranges in there. Here goes the juice. Ooh, making a nice mess. Let's try pouring it from the other end. It's got a good smell. Now the orange powder. I'm just going to spoon all that in. And this will eventually bind and sink and it will form a distinct layer at the bottom. I need to add a bit more liquid in here now. So that's 1.7 litres of spring water I've put in there. I'm not going to add any more in now. There's a room in the top for the Krausen. I don't want to leave it so there's no room for a Krausen because this will definitely form a Krausen. So before going any further, I'm giving the liquid a good mix. So when I take a gravity reading, I'm getting a consistent and accurate figure. Time to take the original gravity. Oh, that's nice and buoyant. That's a good sign. And I'm starting on an original gravity of 1.096. That's bang on where I wanted it to be. Right, let's get the dry ingredients in there now. So I'm going to add a bit more pectolase, just a flat teaspoonful. I don't want it to be a cloudy, murky drink if possible. Then I'm going to add two generous heaped teaspoonfuls of yeast nutrient, which in all honesty is probably not needed because there's lots of fibre in there for the yeast to be feeding on. And finally, let's get my yeast in. So I'm using Young's dessert high alcohol yeast. Never used this yeast before ever but I'm hoping that this is going to do the job for me. Now it says this packet does up to 23 litres so I'm only going to put half of the packet in here and I'll save the rest for another brew. Okay that's about half the packet in there and I'm just going to rock the fermenting vessel a little bit just to get that yeast to begin to sink. Nothing too dramatic. I just want that motion on the ocean. It's time to put my fermenter together now. Very straightforward. So here's the trug trap. That goes in top. That prevents, if it does form a big kraus and it prevents solids from entering the airlock. And the airlock is integrated. And that simply just screws on. You've just got to make sure it's not cross-threaded and you get a nice tight fit. Just a tiny bit of water to go into the airlock and that'll flood out of the back which is fine. I'm on the drainer and then it's just a case of putting this on top so it snaps into place and then twisting the top so it holds it in place tightly and this is now airtight on top. There it is now. Right, that's good. I've got my fermenter labelled up now. So Aperol, 18th of January 23, which is brew day one, and the original gravity of 
It's now just a case of playing the waiting game for fermentation to begin. I'll get back to you with an update when that happens. Okay, it's a brew day two update. And I'm just showing you the garden because you can see the frost on the shed. It's currently minus two outside and it's been minus four overnight. That means the house in general is just too cold. I'm struggling getting things fermenting and this hasn't started off. So I've put it onto a heat mat. So here it is. This is the mat just there. It's a pad rather than a mat, I guess. Now that is connected into a timer plug and every 40 minutes this comes on for 20 minutes and then it goes off for 40 minutes then on for 20 minutes off for 40 minutes on for 20 minutes and what i'm trying to do is to get the temperature up from what it currently is at 14 to somewhere between 18 and 20. so i might have to mess around with the timer plug and when it comes on and off but there is no sort of thermostat control on this so i'll come back to you with an update later on let's see what happens so just a 12 hour later brew day two update and you can see we have Krausen and there is activity in the airlock. You might not see a bubble as I'm filming this because it's not very frequent but it's happening. The heat pad has done its work and we're now on 18 degrees and it might even get up to 20 if we're lucky but it's coming on and off and I'm happy enough with this. So I'm going to leave it as it is for now and I'll come back to you in a few days time. So just a brew day six update. Fermentation and flocculation is happening nicely. And I'm getting a steady stream of bubbles through the airlock. I managed to get this between 18 and 20 using the pad on an on and off basis. I'll come back to you at the time of racking. Good afternoon from the kitchen folks, it's my homemade Aperol racking day, let's have a look at it. So here it is and it has stopped fermenting after a good three weeks of fermentation. So this is brew day 23 and I'm overall very happy with how fermentation has gone so far. The heat mat that it was on has done a great job because it's been very cold outside. So I'm happy that the fermentation has happened. The temperature of the brew has hovered between 18 and 22 for the entire fermentation period. So just looking at it in the fermenter, you can see that the trub is up to there. So what I want to do today is to take it out of here. So this is all the good stuff between there and there. I want to take it out of here and I want to wash this fermentation vessel. I'm going to transfer the homemade Aperol into these two demijohns. And in doing so, I need to sanitise my equipment. So I've got a muslin cloth just there, which is boiling away. And I've got everything else in this big pan, just cleaning. So once I've got the brew into these two demijohns, I'm going to clean the fermenter out and then add some fruit juice and then add this back into the fruit juice and let it ferment a bit longer. So I'm going to be taking some gravity readings. There will be some maths. Please bear with me. I'll try and explain it as best I can. And then that will be it for today. I'll be leaving it then to continue fermenting with the fruit juice in it. And we'll work out what the final ABV is in probably about three or four weeks time. Okay, I'm just about ready to proceed. So today there will be no siphoning. I'm going to be using the tap on the Muntins wine fermenter, transferring the Aperol via a jug through the muslin cloth and a sieve and a funnel into the demijohns. So I need to begin by equalising the air pressure within the fermenter, so I just need to undo the top slightly, there we go. And then it's simply a case of opening the tap and filling the jug. Ah, easier said than done, so there's obviously some sediment in the tap. So my wonderful plan isn't going to work as anticipated. I could siphon, but I'm not. I'm going to pour instead. So this has got the potential to be very messy, but hopefully not, fingers crossed. So I'm gonna get this all the way off now. Now it does smell wonderful and it does have a very slight Aperol smell to it actually. Wow, okay, I'm happy. So it's gonna be just a pour from there 
into there. Here we go. Oh, it seems to be going all right, actually. The more exposure to air and the more things this is touching, the more chances there are of contamination. And that's always a risk when you're brewing. I'm just going to have to do what I can. So far, it's looking all right. So I've now transferred my funnel, sieve and muslin cloth into the next demijohn. Let's have a look at the first one. And that doesn't look too bad at all. I'm just going to pour a bit out. And then just for safety's sake, I'll stick an airlock in. Okay, that's the first demijohn done. I'll come back to it shortly. And now continuing the pour into the second demijohn. Now there's a lot more trub coming out now. That's why the muslin cloth has been valuable. And I've got it double folded. So I'm not far above the trub line just there. And you can see that this is now going through quite slowly. That means there's stuff getting stuck in there, which is not going through into the demijohn, which is good. Also, just to add at this point, if you're noticing the husky voice, it's not COVID. Don't worry about that. Just got a common cold. They still exist. Anyway, this is going to take a few minutes. I'll come back to you shortly. Okay, I'm back. That was a bit of a job, but I've done it. And this is what I've got. And I'm estimating that I've got about eight litres of my Aperol homebrew in those two demijohns. These hold four and a half, 4.54 litres when full. So that one is full and there's capacity in that one. I'm going to guess I've got about eight litres there. This has a 10 litre capacity. So if I can add two litres of fruit juice into that, then that makes this back up to capacity without all that trubbiness and it will continue to ferment very slightly. So I'm now going to pour from here back into there with the fruit juice and with that. Okay, so the first four and a half litres goes back in. And 4.54 litres is an imperial gallon if you work in gallons. Eight pints. That was nice and straightforward. I'm now going to get the second one back in there. So at this point in the brew, I'm going to take a gravity reading to establish where I am in terms of alcohol by volume. Because when I started, this was on 1.096. So I want to see where I am now. And I'm on exactly 1.000. So before going any further, I want to work out what the ABV of this brew is at this point. So I'm going to take the original gravity of 1.096. I'm going to deduct from that this final interim gravity of 1.000 and that equals 0.096. I'm going to multiply this by 131.25 which equals 12.6. So this is currently 12.6%. However, I'm now going to add fruit juice to it which will dilute it. So the physical volume ratio of the fruit juice to the Aperol needs to be taken into account so I can work out what the adjusted alcohol by volume is after I've added the fruit juice. So first of all, I'm going to add a litre of pure orange juice from Concentrate. Then I'm going to add a litre of pure apple juice from Concentrate. Now I've still got some capacity in there and I'm wondering whether to add any more juice. So I've just read that the Munton's wine fermenter actually holds 11.25 litres of liquid, not 10 litres. That was my mistake. So I've got 1.25 litres, I reckon, capacity in the top. So I'm going to add another litre of apple juice. I'm not going to add any more orange juice because I know orange is the essential flavour in Aperol, but I think it might make it too acidic and this is going to be more of a neutral flavour. It will add sweetness and sugars and some flavour, but it won't be overpowering compared to the other fruit that's in there. So in it goes. And you can see that this is immediately reducing the headspace 
there was a bit too much headspace for my liking in there to be honest so this is much better and I reckon I've now got this up to 11 litres. So before going any further I want to get my Muntons wine fermenter put back together. So I'm just rinsing off the sanitised components, the filter and now we've got the big airlock. Remember it's the big integrated airlock that goes in there and that just screws nicely into place. There we go. Okay I've got the fermenter back on the heat pad, that's now back on. The temperature is currently 18. I'm going to let it warm up to 22 and what that will do is it will wake up the yeast which is still in suspension in here and that will start to eat the sugars from the fruit juice which has gone in and that will then alter the alcohol by volume. But first things first, now I've added that three litres of fruit juice to this, we need to establish what the adjusted alcohol by volume or ABV is now at this point. So I'm going to say that this contains eight litres of homemade Aperol and three litres of fruit juice currently. That means there's an 11 litre capacity altogether. So I say eight divided by 11 times 100 equals 72.7%. So the physical volume of this is 72.7%. For argument's sake, let's say 73% of the Aperol mixture and 27% of the fruit juice mixture. So this was 12.6% alcohol by volume. I now need to reduce that by a ratio of 27% to take into account the dilution from adding the fruit juice. However, it's still got some more fermenting to do because there are sugars in that fruit juice that I added. And now I need to take another gravity reading. So one more dip with the stick before finishing for today. And this is immediately more buoyant than it was before. And this is now giving me a reading of 1.010. Okay, that's just about it for now. I'm just gonna label this up with my new readings. That's now done. So the next film that you see from me will be bottling and that's probably going to be in about a month's time. So I'll catch you then folks. Morning from the kitchen folks. I'm just having an Aperol update. This is brew day 43 and this has now been stood and settling for 20 days since I last showed you. Um, I want to get it out of here today so I'm actually going to re-rack it today into two separate demijohns and that will give me a better idea in terms of clarity because this is just a bit wide for me to be able to see through it properly. What I'm wanting to achieve is a nice clear drink. I don't want any cloudiness in it and I'm very patient. I'm more than happy to wait as long as it takes. What I'm going to do firstly is take a sample in my hydrometer tube so I can take the gravity at this point to work out the alcohol by volume. So there's 100 mil there and I shan't put this back into it. So in goes the hydrometer and that has sank rather nicely. And I'm now on a gravity reading of 0 0.996. So I'm now going to calculate the alcohol by volume as it currently is. So this brew was already 9.2% and when I racked it, it was on 1.010. So I go 1.010 minus 0 0.996 equals 0 0.014 multiplied by 131.25 equals 1.83%. And I'm going to add this to what it was previously, which was 9.2%. And that tells me I've got 11.0375%. So we can just say 11%. This is a fluke. It's an unintentional fluke, but I'm very happy with that because Aperol is also 11%. So as it currently stands, I'm on exactly the same alcohol by volume as Aperol. I'm happy with that. So I'm going to drain this into the two demijohns using the tap, which is built into the Muntons wine fermenter. And I can see from the colour of that that it isn't clear enough for me yet, but hopefully it will settle.
there's no need for you to watch the whole process, it's not that exciting. I'll come back to you when I've filled up both demijohns. So my two demijohns are full. Now I've probably got about a litre or so left in there. I could tip it, but I think what I'll do is I'm just going to run it through my air still and I'll extract a bit of spirit off it. And I might as well add this into the mix too. But that won't be in this film, as that isn't the focus of this film. I'm just explaining that I won't be wasting what's left in there. Anyway, I'm curious to see if it tastes anything like Aperol. I have no idea. It smells more like wine, to be honest. It's very heavy, full-bodied. Definitely not conditioned yet. That needs leaving. Now, my first impression was this doesn't resemble Aperol that much. But as it's gone down... And as my tongue's had a chance to recover, that bittering does actually come through. And there is something there that's a resemblance. I think Aperol's probably a little bit sweeter. Anyway, hopefully, you know, this is work in progress. I'm going to get something which is not too far away from Aperol. We'll see. OK, before I finish, I want to just ascertain if the yeasts in here have expired or if they've still got some life in them because I want this to finish as a flat brew. So to that extent, I'm going to add a little bit of dextrose monohydrate brewing sugar into each of the demijohns, not tons. And I will check the gravity again in case it does increase it. But if it doesn't increase the gravity, it will just sweeten this product, which might give it more of an Aperol flavour because this was definitely drier than Aperol. So I'm not putting tons in, and I'm not measuring it. I just want to see if it makes a difference. So I'm going to put my airlocks in place. And there's my bendy one. I love my bendy airlock. I'm happy enough so far. So I've got my damage on labelled up. I've brought them both into the living room, which is the warmest room in the house. And that way I'll be able to monitor them for any further signs of fermentation. I'll come back to you with an update in a week or so's time. Catch you then. Welcome to the entrance porch, folks. I've brought the Aperol in here now on brew day 46. This is three days later. There's been absolutely no sign whatsoever of me adding that sugar contributing to any further fermentation. So I'm happy that the yeast has gone. OK, it's gone to sleep. It's expired. It's done what it needs to do. So it's going to be very, very cold this week. For, uh, nighttime temperatures are going to be between minus two and minus six Celsius. This porch will stay around between one and three degrees Celsius. It's perfect for getting things to clear. So it's great. I'm hoping that that's going to mean whatever materials in here is going to sink to the bottom. Like has happened with my ski to pee over there. And you can't quite tell, but this is a peri which is also clear. It's difficult to tell at night time. I'll catch you at a later date when it comes to bottling. See you then. Good afternoon from the kitchen, folks. It is brew day 64 of my Aperol, and it still isn't clearing. Let's have a look at it. It's been racked and re-racked, and it's still hazy fantasy. This is what I reckon is a pectin haze. We've had some really cold temperatures. We've been down to minus eight at night. Uh, and this has been in a porch which is only a couple of degrees warmer than it is outside. So really it should, should have fallen out by now and it isn't doing so. I think it must be pectin. I'm quite possibly wasting my time doing this, but I'm going to have a go at clearing it with wine finings from Young's. So it's bung out and then the siphoning tube goes in and look at the black clip at the top. That's going to hold it for me nice and steady. You can see where it is and I want it just above the sediment line, but not into the sediment. There's probably only about three or four mil of sediment in all honesty. And me putting it in there has uh, caused a bit of a reaction. We just had a flurry of bubbles at the top. Uh, I'll just push it down a tiny bit more and that's it. I might end up picking a bit of sediment up, but it doesn't matter. Right, as they say in all, let's rock and roll. And in we go. 
Right, so as this is going in, I'm going to add my findings. It's a two-step process. I've done it before. You might have seen me doing it. Findings A, then findings B. Okay, so you put a bit of findings A in at this point while it's going in so it all starts mixing. And I'm literally going to put a dribble. I'm not measuring it, but imagine that that was sort of a, a, a decent teaspoonful of it. That'll do. And now I've just got to wait for this to all empty into there. I'll come back to you shortly. Okay, that's now the first demijohn done with findings A in it. I've now got to repeat exactly the same process with the other demijohn. You don't need to watch me do that. I'll come back to you shortly. Right, that's both of them done for now. I'll come back to you in an hour when it's time to add findings B. See you then. Right, folks, an hour has passed, so it's time to get this back into another demijohn. This time I can just pour it. Oh, just as a update, nothing's changed appearance-wise. So back in, and then halfway through, I'm going to add findings B. I'm going to add the same amount of findings B as I did findings A. Imagine sort of a decent teaspoonful. Is there such a thing as a decent teaspoonful? I don't know. Just a decent one. And the rest of it goes in there. It's got a little bit excited, teenage kicks and all that. So funnel out and airlock in. I've now got to repeat that with the other damage on. You don't need to watch that. I'll come back to you shortly. So I've got my Aperol back in the entrance porch. It looks like there could already be something happening, findings wise, but I don't want to um, jinx it. So let's leave it and we'll have a look tomorrow. And this is the next day. And may I just say, all hail to the power of the finings. They look pretty darn good. I'm going to leave them for a few more days and then I'm bottling. Good afternoon from the kitchen, folks. This is Brew Day 75 and this is an Aperol or my fake Aperol or Faperol update because it's bottling day. And I've just put it on the windowsill, so don't be worried about it being in sun because it's only just been put there for bottling. And that's for gravity purposes because it's higher than my sink. Um, but just look at that. It looks absolutely beautiful. It's so clear, clear as a whistle. The findings have done a tremendous job. Really very pleased with that. Um, colour wise, it's in the right ballpark for Aperol. It's not exactly the same colour, but I think I'm quite happy with that. So I need to shut up, it's time to get it out of them and into these. So just to explain to you, I'm having a slight change of plan. I've decided to keep this damage on as traditional Aperol and this one here I'm going to try and turn into an Aperol sparkling wine. Hence I've got some going into clear glass bottles for the traditional Aperol and then I've got some going into champagne bottles for the one which I'm hoping will be a sparkling wine. Right, it's bowl out, sometimes easier said than done. There we go. Siphoning tube goes in. I need to control the depth of this. I've got a black clip on it, which will hold it in place. But what I don't want to do is disturb that sediment too much because I don't want cloudy Aperol. So the first bit that comes out, I'm going to let go down the sink. That bit would normally go in the hydrometer tube, but I've already got the gravity and the ABV. I'm going to let literally sort of 10, 20 mil go down the sink. That's all. Don't worry. Right, let's crack on. One, two, right, straight into the bottles. Lovely stuff. Yeah, it looks really good. I'm very, very pleased with how this has turned out colour wise. Taste wise, we'll find out. So, as you can see, I'm bottling into a variety of spirit bottles. So there's whiskey bottles, vodka bottles and gin bottles down here. Now, there seems to be a bit of bubbling activity just here, which is a very slight concern. As far as I was concerned, fermentation was over. Maybe just agitating it around is causing that. I haven't put anything in to try and kill off the fermentation. I was hoping it had just finished naturally, but I may have to retrospectively do something. Let's hope not though. Oh, 
And this is just going to work out nicely, I think. There we go, bubbles in the siphoning tube, just as this bottle fills up. Lovely stuff. So there's my bottles in the sink, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've now got to find six bungs that will fit these bottles just nicely. And I know that some people are going to be tempted to say, oh, you should be using a proper wine cork and all that business. It, I'm not bothered, right? It's not going to last long enough for me to be bothered about doing that. So this is all going to be gone in the next couple of months. So that's why I'm not doing that. Okay, that's all six bottles bunged. I'm just going to give them a little shower to wash any sticky residue off of the outside of them. And then I'm going to leave these to drain on this towel just here. Okay, so there they are. They need labelling yet, but they can stand and drain for a while. Now the beauty of using this kind of bung in these bottles is that if there is any danger of fermentation happening, then the pressure that within there will push these up. And if these start to raise up, then I'll know that maybe I need to put something in there to kill it off. Fingers crossed though, I won't need to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to attempt to make an Aperol sparkling wine. So in order to do that, I need to add a little bit more sugar into each bottle. So this is just standard household granulated sugar. There's about a teaspoon in there and that is per 750ml bottle. So if there is any yeast left in suspension in there, and there's a good chance that there isn't because the finings might have dragged it out. But if there is any yeast in there and it finds this sugar, it will smash it apart a, a fractional fermentation will take place and that will cause a pressure to build up which will give it a sparkle. Now I've got to say I'm quite sceptical about it sparkling because I think that the findings have dragged the yeast right into the sediment at the bottom and I don't think there'll be any yeast left in suspension in there. But if there is, there is a chance I might be able to make a sparkling wine off it. It's all a big experiment. Let's find out. So just as before, bung comes out, siphoning tube goes in and I want it just above the sediment line. And there it is now. So the sediment line is there, the tube is there, there is about three or four mil in between. The first bit that comes out might be a bit murky so I'll put that down the sink like last time. Right, let's crack on. First bit's milky, now it's clear, straight into the bottle. Lovely stuff. Yeah, it does look really, really good. I just hope it tastes really, really good. And into the second bottle. And there's definitely a reaction to the priming sugar, so that is a positive thing for a sparkle. This is a good sign. So experience tells me that I should manage to get six full bottles out of this, but not if I let it run over like I did that one. That's because I've took my eye off the prize. So There we go. Never take your eye off the prize. So this is going to be nerve-wracking actually. Am I going to get it full or not? Okay, there we go. Bubbles in the siphoning tube. Once I've drained the siphoning tube, will the bottle be full? Let's find out. So despite my cockiness thinking I would get six full bottles, I haven't. So this one is going to become tonight's sampler. Well, it's a lovely day outside. Why not have a little sample? But I won't be filming that. You will be getting a full opening and tasting and comparison to Aperol in a future segment of this film. Okay, I need to bung and cage these bottles because if fermentation happens, pressure will build up and it'll go pop. So the bung is essential and the cage is even more essential to keep the bung in place. So as I said, they've been softening in very hot water, which is very hot. Each one gets pushed into the bottle like so, cage goes on top, pulled down tight, twisted and twisted and twisted until it's completely 
locked into place. And that one is just fine. Okay. So there is an example of a bunged and caged bottle. I've got four more to do. I'll be back to you shortly. So that's all five bottles bunged and caged. So once again, a quick shower just to get any sticky residue off the outside. So there's all of my bottles draining nicely on the tea towel. Let's make some labels. Okay, I've made a very simple label using a template designer for this Fomimo Bluetooth printer. And I'm now going to print these out. This is for the still ones. And then just the same for the sparkling ones. I thought I'd do vertical labels for a change. I don't usually. There. One down, a few to go. I'll come back to you when they're all done. And there they are, like five happy chappies. I've got to do the still ones. It's exactly the same process. You don't need to see that. So let's talk about conditioning. So in terms of conditioning, I'm doing that in my living room. That's the conservatory. It's south facing, that door stays open. The heat comes in. It's only April and it's currently 19 degrees and it is 6.25 in the evening. So this is pretty good. As soon as you get some sunshine, the whole room warms up and that is where my sparkling Aperol will condition. So the conditioning process will allow the flavour to develop, but more importantly for the sparkling one, if there is any yeast left in suspension, that's when the secondary fermentation will take place. That's when I'll get a sparkle. Now, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I suspect it won't, but fingers crossed, it might do. So I'm going to open this in about six weeks time. So I'll catch you then and we'll see what happens. Now, before then, also, I need to stress that we've got my still Aperol to look after. Now, as for my still Aperol, I'm just going to keep them in my office, which is the coolest room in the house. It rarely gets above 13 degrees Celsius in here. So therefore, I'm quite confident that that is cool enough to not kickstart any fermentation. I'm hoping there won't be any fermentation, but because I've got these bottles at this height, I can keep scanning them to see if the bungs are starting to raise. And if they are, then I know I need to do something about that, like get some Camden uh, tablets or something. But hopefully I won't need to go down that road. Hopefully they've been left long enough and fermentation is done. Right, I'll give you an update as to where I am with opening tasting or whatever happens Oh, in a few weeks' time. I'm knackered. I think I need to drink that sampler. Yeah, that's a good idea. See you later. can see it's a beautiful day in the garden and that beautiful day has unfortunately come at a price. Houston we have a problem. So I came home last night and I thought I'll just have a look at my Aperol bottles see how they're getting on and all of the bungs were raised and one of them was just about to pop out so obviously I was very concerned. I didn't have a charge camera I couldn't film the process but what I've actually done is empty them all into this demijohn, which you might notice is popping. A secondary fermentation without any priming sugar has taken place. And this is now a sparkling Aperol, which is not what I wanted in these bottles. Now the sparkling Aperol in the champagne bottles, absolutely fine. I know that that's gonna be sparkling now, but this, this could have been bottle bombs, or I could have just blown the corks out, which is more likely, and then it would have ended up tasting like vinegar. The situation now then is that I've had to empty these bottles and clean them out. I've got this in a demijohn and you can actually see that there is a little bit of sediment in the bottom. So actually I'm going to end up with a cleaner product anyway. But if you look closely, you will see rising bubbles. So there is still something going on fermentation wise. This was completely a surprise to me. This has not happened before. I've always waited and waited and waited before bottling and I've had to be confident that it isn't going to ferment in the bottles, but I'm glad I put the kind of bungs in that I did, which are obviously the indicator that when they rise, hang on, something's going on. So, okay, I'm just gonna to demonstrate to you how much life there is in this. So I shall just take the bung out for a second. 
So what I'm going to do is add some normal household caster sugar into the demijohn and watch what happens in terms of a reaction. Okay, now if that had finished fermenting altogether, that wouldn't have happened. So that sugar is getting smashed apart and when I put the airlock on, the yeast is still doing something in there. And you'll notice now, watch, pop, 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 pop. This is still very active. I think the really warm weather has probably triggered this, but I should have really stopped it with something, some sort of stabiliser anyway. So I've been to Wilco and I've got some Camden tablets. And if I add one crushed tablet to this, that should kill off this fermentation. However, because I've just added that bit of sugar in there, I'm just going to leave it for three days and let that work its way through. It will increase the ABV by a fraction, but it's not going to do too much damage. And it might just sweeten the flavour that little bit. So yes, yeah, so this was an unexpected part of the film, but nevertheless, it's a lesson learned once again. So don't always trust that fermentation has ended just because you can't see bubbles. Okay, right. So these will be going in in about three days time. Right. Catch you in a few days. Well, folks, it's one week later and here's an Aperol update. And if you can see through that, you will see that there is still bubbling and fermenting going on. So I basically need to decide, do I kill it now or do I let it carry on? And I've decided that I'm going to kill it now by adding the Camden tablet. So there's my Camden tablets from Wilco. I'm just going to open these up. And that is what they look like. Now one crushed tablet is sufficient for a gallon and I haven't got quite a gallon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crush a tablet and put three quarters of the powder, if I can, in there. So the easiest way to crush a Camden tablet is in between two teaspoons. So tablet goes on bottom spoon, other spoon goes on top, and then you push them together and that crushes down into a powder. Okay, there's the powder. I promise you it's nothing illegal. So the airlock comes out and I'm gonna put three quarters of this powder into the demijohn. Okay, airlock back in. Now you can see an immediate reaction to that powder, but that powder will spell the end of the yeast, or at least that's the plan anyway. So I'll come back to you with an update in a few days time. See you then. Well folks, after a long, arduous, and at times annoying journey, it's opening and tasting time for my Aperol. This is brew date 185, but I don't think it's really going to be like Aperol. And I think if we have a look to my side, then there is definitely a distinct difference between genuine Aperol and my Faperol, my fake Aperol. Now, I did not realise how red Aperol actually is. I thought it was orange. I mean, it is a dark burn orange, I guess, stroke red, but in comparison, mine is ginger or yellowy. It could be argued that mine is a shade of orange, but it doesn't look anything like Aperol. So this is genuine Aperol. I'm just going to pour some into this shot glass. I'm not going to shot it. I'm going to sip it. But I want to compare it flavour wise to mine. Now, I, I don't think I'm really keen on this neat. I would have it in spritz. And I could go to the trouble of making spritz, but seeing as though this is likely so far away from the mark, I'm not going to do that on this occasion. Now, if you remember, I was having problems getting the fermentation to stop. Um, it's been, I, I did put the Camden tablet in, it's been in the fridge. I've done everything that I should have done to stop the fermentation. So when I open this, I'm hoping I don't get a sparkle, but I don't know. Let's see. Pour it and see what it looks like. And in fact, there is a very mild sparkle still in there. I think it looks like a little bit of effervescence. You see that? That's not a great thing. It's particularly not in that style bottle. So yeah, it's not really worked, has it? 
So genuine Aperol. It's like burnt oranges and benolin medicine-y, but that's the flavour of it. My Faparol. It's like bitter oranges. Actually, it's more palatable, believe it or not. I think that would make quite a nice wine. Mm. It doesn't taste like it, but it's actually actually very palatable. It tastes like an orange wine with a definite hint of orange skin in there, but not bad, not in a bad way. Yeah. So I think there's some partial success in the fact that at least I can drink it, but it's not Aperol, okay? So this is my first attempt at making Aperol. So I think, seeing as though it's 11%, that is wine strength. This will be enjoyed tonight in the conservatory. I need to go back to the drawing board. Any suggestions, folks, please leave me some comments. I would love to be able to make something that looked and tasted just like this. So please, if you know how I can do that, let me know. So the other Aperol, if you remember, I made this version and I made some sparkling Aperol as well. So we'll be opening the sparkling Aperol um, in a few days time and I'll test that one also for you. Okay, folks, catch you on the next opening and tasting segment. Good evening from the kitchen, folks. It's my sparkling Aperol grand opening night. So you've already seen me open the flat Aperol and compare it. This is now me trying the Aperol, which I added some brew sugar to, to condition and hopefully to make a sparkling wine. I've got no idea whether it's worked or not. Hopefully it will have conditioned. So let's see what happens when I open it. So I'm gonna use a little dessert fork to help me open it because it's a bit sharp. The old cage. So pull as you twist and then it doesn't wrap over itself. And that's it. That cage is good for another use. The bung has raised minutely on that side. I don't know if you can see. Whether that means it's sparkled or not, I don't know. I mean, it's fermented out to 11%. I'm 50-50 as to whether we'll have a sparkle or not. I won't know till I open it. So let's crack on. Are we ready? A one, a two, a three. Oh yeah, 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 we have it. Oh yeah. Bit of a pop and vapour and an immediate rush of bubbles into the top of the bottle. That's a good sign. So, faithful cask mark Bruegel. Oh yeah. Oh, we've got a sparkler. Right, let's get the picture for the front of the video up. Let's taste it now. So, actually, first things first, let's give it a sniff. Get my nose in there and I've got dry oranges. Definite orange, definite big citrus hit, really a dry smell as well. It's not overly gassy, but it's actually quite nice because it, it just tickles your tongue. It tastes like some kind of orange vermouth, but sparkling. It is kind of like the orange equivalent to Skeeter Pea. You know, Skeeter Pea being a sparkling lemon wine, which is extremely lemony and zesty. This is the orange version, but it's like a very bitter dry orange version and when I'm saying bitter I don't mean in a bad way I mean that's just the quality of the flavour that's what I was going for with Aperol well it's certainly drinkable I don't think I could drink more than one bottle on a session in fact I'm probably not going to drink a whole bottle on a session but I will be sharing it so I think one or two glasses of this is enough because it's quite an overpowering flavour but it's not unpleasant, that's absolutely for certain. So I think the sparkling version of it is, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy with it. It's been a fair old success. So, right, anyway, I'm going to enjoy this. So cheers, folks, and I'll catch you on the next brew, whatever that may be. Oh, I don't know. <sighs> the film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production you can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. 
If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the home and garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.